Welcome back for another segment of POPA On Point. My name is Brian Moriguchi. I'm president of the Professional Peace Officers Association. We're here to continue our conversation about morale within the LA County Sheriff's Department. My guest today is Jim McDonald, Sheriff of Los Angeles County. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Brian. Uh, you mentioned CCJV, so let me transition into some of the jail issues. Uh, in particular, our non-sworn. First, let me, let me thank your Assistant Sheriff, Kelly Harrington. Mm -hmm. When he came in, it is our understanding that he reviewed the relieved of duties mm -hmm. right away right. and made some adjustments, and, and that's what we're looking for. That's the kind of leadership we're looking for, so we appreciate that. Thank you. The non-sworn side in our jails, uh, the custody assistants, and uh, well, the custody assistants in particular, there's always been significant heartache over what their role is and how they're treated mm -hmm. in the jails, even their title as custody assistant. Uh, it's our opinion that they don't assist deputies. They actually have a function in the jails, uh, and a lot of it is very similar to what the deputies in the jails are doing. Would you be open to uh, maybe even a, a complete restructure in jail, if that's, mm -hmm. if that's uh, your plan? We'd like to hear what that plan is. Mm -hmm. But a change in the name of custody assistant to maybe correction officer or, or some other name. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to... Uh, to a name change, I don't know what the appropriate name would be, and it would probably be a panel of people we'd put together to be able to come up with uh, the moves forward. Uh, but we are looking at what are our needs in the years ahead. Can we possibly, through the recruitment and hiring that we're doing, meet the needs of the organization? Are there better ways to deploy uh, individuals working in the custody environment? I don't know that there's a more difficult place to work in America than in America's largest jail and unfortunately by default America's largest mental institution. Uh, we are put in a position and our people are put in a position where uh, they're taking on roles and responsibilities that uh, are extremely difficult, extremely demanding, um, and in some cases you could argue, I think, uh, unreasonable in that we have, we're putting people who come in with uh, you know, professional training, but not, not the training um, that you would expect somebody to have who's dealing with people who are seriously mentally ill every single day. And I take my hat off to our employees who day after day do this very difficult, very complex, and sometimes very dangerous job in an exceptional manner. It makes us all very, very proud of them. But we should be moving as we go down the road, moving into a position where we can advocate for community-based mental health care and treatment. And so the default place to, to put people who act out on their illness is not jail it's in treatment outside in a, in a non-custodial environment uh, where they can get help and therapy and be able to rehabilitate themselves to the degree that that's medically possible. Um, but in the meantime, we're left dealing with this very difficult problem. Uh, so I wanna be able to provide any support I can for those who are doing it. So I would welcome the ability to sit down with uh, a group of people who do it every day and come up with solutions. Maybe we can do the same committee as we talked about mm -hmm. with the recruitment process. Sure. And, and put a group together, which would include the unions as well. Oh, that'd be great. So, yeah. uh, let me ask another question about our custody assistants and security officers. Mm -hmm. The jails are a violent place. Right. The streets are a violent place. And our non-sworn have contacts with them, criminals, mm -hmm. hard, hardcore criminals on a regular basis. What they've asked for is uh, some level of protection when they're off duty, that they ha have encounters with some, some of these bad people not dissimilar to what we encounter as sworn. Mm -hmm. uh, they have asked for uh, CCWs to be issued to them. What are your thoughts on CCWs for the employees? You know what, I wanna be able to protect our people in, in any way that's reasonable. Uh, if somebody has specific threats, if somebody has a, an articulable reason why they would need a CCW, um, you know, based on uh, the duties in the jail, based on their, uh, their overall situation, then we would weigh those on a case-by-case -case basis, as we would do for any member of the community. Uh, I would not be supportive at this time of a blanket approval for CCWs for everybody who works in the custody environment. I think that would be an overreach at this point. Um, in, in looking at uh, you know the big picture, we need to be able to support our people in any way possible. And you had mentioned to me earlier about um, a DMB confidentiality for all of our employees. And that's something that uh, while in today's world with the internet and availability of so much about any individual uh, uh, through the web, uh, certainly DMB confidentiality is a step that gives a level of comfort, I believe, to an individual and their family. Um, 
our current uh, policy and procedures as it relates to DMV confidentiality is to grant that to any any sworn member of the department and any professional staff who have contact with the inmate population uh, and then others on a case-by-case -case basis with the approval of their unit commander uh, you know so that they can articulate why they feel that they, they this would be helpful to them and their family and certainly that's the policy that we want to move forward with that it's available to us um, and we just need to you know hear from people as to what their needs are just for clarification, when you say uh, contact with the inmate population, we're talking the custody assistants, but right. we also have security officers out in the field that have contact right. with the criminal element. They're just not inmates right. yet. Right. Right. So right. would you would apply that to them we as well? We definitely take a look at them as well, sure. Absolutely. Okay, great. You know, on the issue of CCWs, uh, we would argue, and we're open to further discussion on this, but we would argue that the deputies and sergeants lieutenants who are in the jails uh, are exposed to the same risk as those custody assistants. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in the same environment contacting the same people and our sworn side does have protection outside when they're when they're off work right. with their CCW protections right. or peace officer status. Our, our custody assistants though don't have that protection yet the dangers still exist. Mm -hmm. The same dangers that apply to the deputies and sergeants lieutenants mm -hmm. applies to those custody assistants as well. Right. So I know you're not ready yet but we'll yeah. we'll try and convince you otherwise <laughs> right and yeah, no, i appreciate that but by virtue of uh of being a sworn deputy sheriff that uh there are expectations that are that are not there for others in the organization to be able to take uh action when they see a crime going down you know 24 7 really that's something that i don't know that there's a deputy sheriff or a police officer in america um, that wouldn't wouldn't take a, uh, action or steps to be able to help save a life well, on duty or off duty uh, so they're in ability, they have an ability to be able to do that based on, uh, you know, their job description. Uh, that same level is not there for all employees within the department, although I know just coming from the gut, most people would try and, and do what they could. Yeah, we've had several of our non-sworn right. do some pretty heroic things. Uh, we had one recently that, that went into a burning yeah. bus, I, I believe it was, was amazing. Yeah. saved yeah. some lives. So I would agree with that. Yeah. Another area of concern in the morale survey was promotions. Mm -hmm. That was a big complaint from uh, all the ranks, really. Uh, whether it's promotions to sergeant, lieutenant, captain, commander, it made no difference. The complaints were the same. In past administrations, there was a belief that you had to be tied to certain executives or be in favor with them or make campaign contributions in order to get promoted. Uh, with the changeover, you coming in setting a different tone uh, that has changed but the promotion process doesn't seem to have changed a whole lot where favoritism still occurs depending on which executive if is making the right. decision he's promoting at least it appears to us that he's promoting he or she is promoting friends or people that work directly for that individual right. and discounting the rest of the department mm -hmm. we have thousands and thousands of people who are qualified more qualified, we believe, than a lot of the people who are getting promoted. Um, one of the things that we would like to see is a change in the promotion process. One is a change in the banding system, which allows them to pick uh, a lower scored person over a higher scored person, or some mechanism to prevent an executive from picking their, their racquetball partner and promoting, promoting him or his uh, his aide that uh, that has worked the field for two months or three months mm -hmm. and promoting him to the next level. One of the suggestions we had, and I know this is out, thinking outside the box, but was to have a committee review all the candidates who are eligible for promotion to whatever that level is and that the unions be part of that discussion and that ultimately a, a list of whatever amount you want, let's say you're looking to make 10 promotions, and this committee would submit to you 30 or 20 or 30 of the top candidates. This would eliminate a single executive picking their buddy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that list would go to you for selection. So ultimately, you still have the same ability yeah. to select. Would you be open to that? I know I'm thinking way outside the box on this one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's outside the box, all right. It's, you know, it's one of those situations where I think no matter what you do, there's always going to be a perception of uh, somebody picking friends, picking favorites in some fashion. Um, because we're all human and ultimately somebody gets picked so somebody will find some nexus if they're looking for it to be able to determine why that happened. 
Um, when people are put in aid positions, it's often to get a look at them because they've already done a number of other different roles, uh, have proven themselves, and now they're being looked at in this role to be able to see can they do the work and to be able to get to know the person to see if they're the right person for the next level. And so often uh, aides you see get promoted, but they're in that position for that reason, to look at them to see if they're eligible uh, you know, for the next level. And so as you look around uh, our process, my, my hope and goals are that uh, everybody has a fair shot, that everybody has the ability to be able to get expose, exposure to people who are gonna make the decisions uh, for promotion. In an organization as large as ours, that's difficult. There are good people in the field who don't get the same level of exposure to department executives as someone who's working in, uh, in the Hall of Justice. And that's something that I, I don't know that there's a way around that. I'd be open to hearing any alternatives we have on that. Um, but my goal is to pick you know, the best and the brightest in the organization. And I'm not always uh, so concerned with how much time they have compared to someone else. Um, I'm looking for talent, I'm looking for fire in the belly, I'm looking for somebody with enthusiasm, excitement, because that is contagious. Somebody who has leadership skills uh, may, may not be the person who comes out number one on the list, but they have other things that we're looking for that'll help move the organization forward. So really there's a number of different things we're looking for on what somebody can bring to the table uh, in determining whether or not they get promoted to the next level. So, you know, I understand um, how perceptions work. I understand that people will view pe other people who are being promoted as maybe not as uh, not as eligible or not as capable as someone else m may be, and that may well be the case, but we try and do the best job we can. I solicit input from all of our department executives, and I try and get out there as well and, and meet in as many people as I can in various positions throughout the department and be able to make my own assessment but the, the reality is, again, we're spread out over 4,000 square miles, 18,000 employees. Uh, for me to be able to get to know all of the best candidates for different uh, positions throughout the department, uh, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible. I have to rely on others to be able to, uh, to help uh, give me that kind of insight, and I value that insight, but I'd be willing, certainly, to, to avail myself to uh, more input uh, as to who the, who the potential leaders are, who who the best and the brightest in the organization are. And I'm trying to set us up in a, for, in a position where we're building for the future. We're not just looking for today, but we're looking to see where can we take the LASD in years to come and putting the right people in the right positions. I'm sure you'll find a lot of talent uh, at the lower levels too Absolutely. for the future of the department. Absolutely. One other suggestion would be uh, the resumes that are submitted that, that, that are reviewed by the executives mm -hmm that they be more comprehensive. Right. I just filled out the paperwork for the captain promotional right. exam stuff, not that I'm trying to get promoted. <laughs> but in that, in that paperwork, there was nothing in there about leadership. Mm -hmm. And anything that you've done to, to show that you've done right. any type of leadership at all. Yeah. All I'd ask for was your prior job assignments and accommodations and, and awards. There's nothing in there to sh for an applicant to say, I've taken a leadership role on this department and outside this department. Yeah. It's not in that process whatsoever. So even though I, I appreciate what you're saying and trying to look for those people who have those skills, right. uh, even more so than time on and all the other right. stuff, it's not in that process. And so then it is just who, who knows that right. about an individual. Right. So uh, I, I would suggest okay. that maybe you incorporate some of that in, that in the resumes that need to be filled out so that you can find people who actually can document that they've done They're some sort of yeah. leadership and, and show well, that I talent that you're that. looking yeah. for. I appreciate that, and we'll take a look at that, that system. Uh, again, that's a self-assessment, so you're getting somebody's, uh, their own evaluation of their own skills, uh, and it's something that we realize has limitations and we need to look deeper into what they're self-reporting. Um, but, but it's something certainly what you bring up, they have an opportunity to be able to showcase what they did to show their leadership skills. Uh, and to me, it's, it's very important as well to show what they did in their off, off time as well, to show what their, their leadership responsibilities, what they've taken on, uh, whether it relates to family, whether it relates to uh, you know, civic engagement within the communities in which they live, uh, or in the profession. Uh, they were involved in other, uh, other organizations that help move us forward as a profession too, very important. We have a lot of members out there on their own time doing a lot of charitable Absolutely. work, which yeah. which does further the image yeah. of this department. And I think that 
That's that is important. valuable, so uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. So at our crime lab, we have a lot of mixture of different classifications doing very similar work. So there's a, a very clear disparate pay for the same work. What are your visions for the crime, crime lab? Yeah, the crime lab, uh, as well as many of uh, our positions staffed by professional staff throughout the organization, uh, my goal is to use deputy sheriffs where we need deputy sheriffs uh, and to be able to get professional staff to do the job that's best done by those who specialize in, with, you know, for instance, within the crime lab uh, environment, uh, you know, criminalists, uh, people who, who have uh, a, a career path within their, within their job function, uh, but somebody who is, that's their role, that's their job, that's what they came on to do, and they are truly a specialist, and that is their profession. Uh, to be able to reward that, to increase civilianization where that makes sense, and uh, with the increased level of specialty we see throughout, uh, you know, particularly that arena, but also when you look at the cyber front, you look at uh, financial crimes, you look at so many different things where we need people who are specialists with computers, more and more so every day, uh, specialists in, in the sciences to be able to do what's now available to us with DNA testing, with so many other things that we now have available to us. And so the goal is to be able to bring in those who have the greatest level of uh, talent within their chosen field and not to look at everybody as a generalist as we did for so many years and we just put another another person in the place said get smart on this and you're now the you're now the person who's in charge of this but rather to seek out those who have the skills the talents the training and the education to be the best in their field at what they do let me talk about carping for a minute uh, carping is basically taking administrative folks and putting them in line uh, level positions once a week in, in some instances. We complained about that because uh, a lot of our members were being uh, tasked with doing their job in four days instead of five right. and to help reduce the overtime and the, and the shortage of personnel. We brought this issue up during contract negotiations. We uh, encouraged the Board of Supervisors to give the department more money to resolve, to eliminate carping altogether which they agreed to, and the department had a plan to eliminate carping. Mm -hmm. We were told by some of your executives that carping would be eliminated, mm -hmm. and it is not. So I'm telling you that uh, they may have called it uh, ARPing or yeah. some other name uh, to say that they didn't actually lie to us. But the reality is we have administrative people, detectives as well, being tasked with working line level instead of their regular job. Mm -hmm. and. It, uh, to be honest, it is just killing morale right. of those people. Uh, do you have plans to eliminate carping, and what are your thoughts about carping in general? Yeah, you know, if I could eliminate it today, I would. Um, the reality is that we are as tight as we are with personnel, and we have to figure out a way to be able to get the mission accomplished. Uh, that has been used. It has been used uh, for too long a period of time. It's something that may be effective as a stopgap for a short period of time in an emergency. Uh, we have taken it and used it much longer than it should have been used, and I, I acknowledge that. Uh, the challenge is we have a job. We have a mission. We have too few people to be able to do that the way it needs to be done. Uh, I certainly realize that somebody who has uh, a detective caseload and you take them out 20% of their time one day a week and put them into a different job, that work doesn't get done by anybody else. It doesn't go away. It backs up. And there's a cost to that, and that cost is significant. And so to the degree that we can continue to move forward and continue to hire people and realize gains um, for the organization, that will help us uh, deal with these issues. Uh, it really comes down to just personnel shortages and trying to make the best out of what we have to work with. Uh, very, very challenging, and I thank everybody um, in the organization for putting up with this for such a long period of time. I know it has an impact on morale, uh, and I am sorry that we have to do it. Uh, but as we move forward, we have to try and be as creative as we can to accomplish the, the mission that's uh, ahead of us uh, to be able to keep L.A. County as safe as it possibly can be. So my pledge is to continue to, to work at uh, increased hiring, uh, creating more gains so that ultimately we can uh, be in a position where we don't have the needs that we have today that aren't fulfilled by enough personnel to do the job. And again, as, as the projections have showed in the environment we're currently in nationally, uh, recruitment is tough, our standards are high. Uh, you know, we have 97% 90, of the people who try and come on the job are not successful in getting, getting on. Um, very, very high standards, 
but at the end of the day, uh, we're the organization that, uh, that we want to be the leaders in our profession. I believe that we are there. I believe that people across this nation within our profession look to us to see where to go next. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, that is uh, uh, a tremendous responsibility, but also something that we should all be very proud of. And so as we move forward, uh, I ask for everyone's patience to, to be able to help get us where we need to go. But also, truly, I need your help. I need people to be able to reach out and help us recruit. Uh, we should be able, hopefully, to, to get people who want to come on this job um, and so that the numbers that we bring on of qualified people give us greater return on investment for the, the time and the, and the money we spend in our recruiting function. To only be able to get three out of 100 who graduate from the academy tells me that we're not recruiting the best and the brightest across the board. The return should be much higher than that, and we'll continue to work, but I need help. All the more reason that we need to solve the hiring problem right. in the department, right. as well as the morale problem, because right. when we talk about people um, encouraging people to apply for this department, right. it, it, the best place to do that is happy employees saying this yep. is a great place to work yep. and reaching down to family and friends to get them to join the department. So yeah. we, we appreciate no, it. And you know what, on the morale issue, I, I, thank, I thank everyone out there who has been as positive as they have been. Um, you know, when I, when I talk about just that fire in the belly, the enthusiasm for the, for the department, for the job, for the profession, uh, and staying positive to, under very difficult circumstances, that takes a real leader. It takes somebody who's special. And I thank everybody who's been able to do that because uh, being positive, being enthusiastic is, in, is uh, infectious. And that's a good infection throughout the department. But being negative and being down all the time and always looking for, uh, for the downside to things is also infectious and that poisons a workplace. So uh, I, thank, I thank everybody for being leaders, for being looking for the bright spots as best they can and being the ambassadors for this organization that, uh, that they have been and will continue to be because we have a tremendous organization, one that I'm very, very proud of and get more so each day. Uh, the more people I get to meet and I, the, the things that I, that I become aware of that people are doing on duty, being creative, being innovative, making the best uh, with what they have. Uh, I was over last week at uh, Cyber Fraud and just looking at the, the, uh, the job that they've been able to do, you know, doing a tremendous amount with you know, very little to work with in, in some cases. Uh, but being very creative. Across the organization, I've seen this. And so as we move forward, hold your head high. You know, we have so much to be proud of. And, and as I mentioned, we are looked to as the leaders in our profession. And uh, we, have, we have a lot to be proud of. We have a lot to be positive about. And we are going through tough times, but we'll get through those tough times together. Staying positive does, uh, is sometimes very difficult. Yeah if you feel that you're being mistreated yeah. or that management is abusing their authority with you. So uh, on the flip side, of, uh, we appreciate that employee, that you want employees to be positive. Uh, and our response would be, we would want management to treat them well sure, sure. so that they, they enjoy coming to work. Really, that's our job as, right. as supervisors and managers is that our good employees want to come to work every single day Absolutely. and do their job. Yeah. They'll be more productive, they'll be happier. Uh, every, everybody benefits in that kind of environment. If morale is low, people are unhappy with work, it's natural that they will become unhappy and non-productive. Yeah, we all have to work together and certainly we want to do our part to, uh, to you know, fulfill everybody's needs, uh, to be able to meet their needs and be able to uh, make us one big team, one that we're all very proud of. And I will say this on a positive note, our survey showed that most of our members are very happy with their immediate supervision mm -hmm. and, uh, and very happy with the jobs that they are assigned to. That's so great. that's a positive sign. Yeah, thank you. So that concludes another segment of POPA On Point. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sheriff Jim McDonald, thank for you, joining Brian. us as well. Thank you.